All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explore Classroom event. My name is Joe Rowski from National Geographic, and I'll be your host for today. For those just tuning in for the first time this month, uh, we are celebrating big cats. So we're talking to scientists and explorers uh, from all around the world who have dedicated their life to studying, to collecting media, to share with the general public, as well as protecting big cats and important habitat uh, around the world. So we do this every December. This is our third December, and we love doing these live uh, big cat events. So before we meet Matthew, who's joining us today, I want to give a quick shout out to any classrooms who are starting to tune in. Uh, with us live via YouTube. Don't forget that you can still get in on the action. Uh, use the chat sidebar, let us know where you're watching from, send in some questions and we'll work those in. And then to any class, take some pictures, share them to Twitter, hashtag explore classroom, tag at Nagio Education. We love to see classrooms in action. All right, we've got a great group of classrooms joining us today from Canada uh, and the US. It's been a great month so far, big cat events uh, from North America, South America, Africa, Asia, uh, so it's been a lot of fun. So we're going to continue today by meeting Matthew Becker. So uh, Matthew is the CEO and Program Director of the Zambian Carnivore Program in collaboration with the Zambia Department of National Parks and Wildlife, as well as other conservation partners. They conduct long-term conservation work on large carnivores. We're talking lions, cheetahs, leopards, wild dogs, spotted hyenas. So with National Geographic's uh, Big Cats Initiative, they do work like combating wire snare poaching, bush meat and wildlife parts trade, assessing population, as well as looking at how land's being managed and used and how humans are encroaching on these important uh, national park areas. So Matt, it's so great to have you joining us live from Zambia today. We've got a great group of classrooms. We're excited to get to know you a little better. Thanks a lot, Joe. And uh, thanks everyone for the opportunity uh, to, to speak with you today. I'm hoping everyone can hear me. The internet <clears throat> connection just gave a signal that it's unstable. Is it okay? Yeah, you're still coming through nicely. Okay, there's going to be a couple cars starting up. I'm broadcasting live from our field camp here in the Luangwa Valley of eastern Zambia. So uh, this was an office day for everybody. And so now, even though it's morning for a lot of you, it's uh, afternoon, early evening for us. So people are heading out. So I apologize that for that, but hopefully you can still hear me. Yeah, no worries. You're coming through nice and clear, Matt. Um, okay. Yeah, heard them roughly in the background, but it's 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 <laughs> nothing that's that's getting in the way. But uh, yeah, we've got great classrooms joining us today. Uh, I know you have a presentation to share, so when you're ready, go ahead and share the screen, and then uh, okay. Q and A action coming at you. Okay, I'm ready, so I'm going ahead and share. Let me know if there's any problem. Otherwise, that should be it. Hopefully. It's good. Okay. Well, I just wanted to talk for uh, the next 20 minutes or so um, about our work here in Zambia on big cats. And so uh, I, as I think Joe mentioned, am um, a National Geographic Explorer. Uh, sorry, let me put this up. Yeah, it looks good, Matt. Just take it full screen. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure it's... Um, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so I wanted to talk about our big cat conservation work as part of the organization that I work with, the Zambian Carnivore Program. And so we work here in Zambia on an array of, of big cats doing conservation work. And so I'm a conservation biologist uh, by trade, and that means working to gather science on these uh, threatened and sometimes endangered species uh, of carnivores um, and assist in guiding conservation efforts for them. And just for those of you who are wondering where Zambia is, if you haven't heard of it, uh, it's uh, here in, in sort of between southern and eastern Africa. And you can see the, uh, the green areas are national parks. Many of those areas are, are where we work. So we work across the country on all three species of, of big cats. And for those of you who aren't familiar with those, of course, there's the lion. And so we work on, on several large populations of lion, study about 400 animals um, across the country. And the largest lion population uh, in the country is right here where I'm calling from the, the Luongo Valley. And we work on cheetah. Uh, these are uh, okay. pretty threatened species. 
and they're in two populations across the country, and they're typically in very small populations. So uh, it's very important to get as much information on them as possible. And then lastly, leopard, and they're found throughout the areas, uh, most areas in Zambia that are natural, and not a lot is known about them. They're a very cryptic species, hard to study. And so the core of our work is following these, these uh, animals, particularly lion and cheetah, uh, because they're, in, in the case of lions, they're highly social. They live in prides, and so those are social groups. Um, can everyone still hear me? Yeah, still, in the south still coming through good, Matt. Sorry. <laughs> I think there's a, a car running there. Um, so the, the way we can follow them is actually uh, through radio collars. So uh, you can see here in the right hand picture, that's Tandiwe Mwetwa in the, in the middle. She's a National Geographic explorer and probably pretty well known to a lot of you who follow big cat work. Um, but they are fixing a radio collar on this lioness here. And that enables us to follow the locations of these animals and collect all sorts of vital information on them. And so here on the left-hand side is, a, is another lioness with her cub and she's got a satellite collar on. And so what that means is that these collars provide a signal and uh, that can actually be picked up by satellites, it gives the GPS location, and then can be downloaded by our emails, and we can actually find where these animals are out in the field. Um, sounds a little easier than uh, it actually is on the ground. Um, we put in a, a big field effort. Zambia is about twice the size of Montana, so it's a very large place, and uh, we cover thousands of, of square kilometers out there. Uh, year round. And here Tandy in the lower left hand is, is radio tracking. So those collars actually also emit a signal, a VHF signal, that uh, researchers can pick up with this, these antennas and home in on them. And when we do that, then we can collect all sorts of, of valuable information because so little is known about these species, what their population size is, what the trends are, and what sort of threats are facing them. And so uh, the, the information is really important. We put about 3,000, if you add up every day that everyone uh, logs in the field, we put about 3,000 days out in the field across three main areas, three main ecosystems in, in the country. And so um, that equates to a lot of time spent out with these animals year round across all sorts of uh, conditions and uh, in very remote settings that are typical of, of where the, the last big populations of these species remain. And we also, because these animals, there's not a lot of them, for example, it's thought probably about 1,200 lions potentially are estimated for, for the whole country. Um, and like I mentioned, we, we follow about 400. And so every one of these animals, we try to follow throughout the entirety of their lifetime because um, they're, they're long-lived species and their rates of survival and how often they reproduce and things can vary depending on how old they are and also if they're a male or female. And here you have one of our team, Dr. Kamwiri Banda, in the lower left, he's collecting information on lions uh, in, the, in the background there. Um, and you can see this lion in the right, uh, we actually can identify. One of the ways you identify these animals, in the case of lions, you actually look at the patterns of their whisker spots, which is uh, not that easy to do. So you need good photographs each time you, you do that. And so the, the way their whisker spots are arranged, just like a snowflake, every one of them is unique. Um, and obviously this guy has got a, a number of scars and things that, that make him pretty easily identifiable. And then you can see in the upper left, these are just all those little dots are locations from those collars. So that's not just one animal, that's, that's a number of animals in one of the areas we're studying. And uh, that provides a, a lot of information about where these animals are, are moving and it allows us to, to uh, follow them uh, year round. As I mentioned also, these animals really vary depending, uh, they vary in how long they live and how many cubs they might have. Um, and 
this depends on whether they're male or female, for example. You can see this is a, on the right hand side is a very old lioness. Um, in the upper left is a, is a young cub with, a, with an adult male. And so virtually every animal we follow, we know how old they are in addition to knowing which individuals they are. And that allows us to get a very good picture of the population. In addition to radio collars and satellite collars, we also use camera traps. And so if you look in the lower right of this slide, you can see the, the lion standing there and right in front of his nose is a camera trap. So that actually is, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, has an infrared beam that the minute any motion goes across that beam and breaks it, um, it takes a picture. And so you can see, not only are we getting pictures of leopards and lions, uh, but we're also getting pictures of their prey, for example, the wildebeest in, in the upper middle. And so this allows us to get a lot of information on very cryptic, hard to see animals like leopards. They can be really hard to see even though they're, they're there. And so trying to figure out how many of them, how many of them there are and what might be the, the threats facing them is really difficult without this sort of technology. So now what sort of work are we, are we trying to address for, for conservation? Well, there's an array of, of problems and threats facing big cats throughout Africa and throughout the world. And in our area, um, one of the biggest is the illegal bushmeat trade. And I'll talk to you a bit about that. But um, here you can see all this wire here. These are actually little nooses that are called snares. And so these are set on game trails and animals walk through them and get caught. And so these are some scouts uh, from um, the Zambian Department of National Parks and Wildlife. And uh, they've collected all these on an anti-poaching patrol and, and have pulled them off the landscape. And so what these snares are intended for is here in the middle picture, you can see there's, this is called bush meat. So this is illegally poached meat from antelope and other animals and and this is a patrol that has found this uh these, this meat is getting dried and that it will be sold commercially um and so that's a big problem because as you can see that leopard is also competing for uh meat sources um with this trade and there's a lot of reasons why there's a bush meat trade obviously poverty is is one of the major driving ones um but also it is a uh um, an international trade. So it's got a, a number of problems. I won't go into that, but that's one of the, the things we address. And also, while no one is typically trying to catch cats in snares, in the upper right, you can see there's a cheetah that has unfortunately wandered into a snare and the snare is tightened around its neck and it died. And so that, that can happen uh, quite often in some areas if there's a lot of snaring. And so in addition to collecting all this information on these animals through radio collars, another very big benefit of uh, this intensive uh, work is that we can follow all these animals across the landscape and see if they actually get caught in snares. Because if we're not able to find them and uh, record and, and monitor uh, whether they, they're carrying snares, they can frequently just die out there and we wouldn't know anything about it. But because we're with them, uh, we can often detect that. And here's a case, this is a lion that uh, was snared several years back. Um, you can see we've immobilized her. So the, the vet is Dr. Sachande on the right. And he has darted her remotely with some chemical drugs. And uh, that has made her basically go to sleep. Like when you go to the dentist or get an operation or something, she's not conscious. She's not aware that, that we're touching her and we're treating her wound and removing the snare, which you can see right in front of Dr. Sachande's left hand. And so she was dying from that, and she was in very bad condition. That's her in the, in the middle, you can see how thin she was. Um, but after being uh, darted and treated, she actually, that's her on the left. You can see she's got a scar on her neck, but there she is mating several months later. And now she's alive and well. And in the lower right, you can see she's got some of her cubs. So she continues to be a, a productive member of the pride, and, and uh, that, that pride continues to do well. Um, thanks in part to her continuing to be on the landscape. And this is just a graphic of, in if we're doing this quite often, which we are because we follow so many cats like this, uh, over time this starts to add up. And this is just a graphic of 
the number of lions that we've we've rescued in that way uh, to date. This graphic needs to be updated, but it's um, 44 lions that we've desnared, and 187 cubs were either born from those lions afterwards, uh, or the actually in the case of say a lioness with young cubs, the cubs would have died if we had not rescued uh, that lioness, and so. A big population impact in addition to all the information we gather uh, on these animals. A lot of uh, the other work we do, I won't go into, but in, in relation to some of the conservation threats, wildlife crime is unfortunately something that's, that's increasing in a lot of areas. People trading in leopard skins, cheetah skins, lion skins, and bones and things. And we work with a number of people to help combat that here in Zambia. And you can see on the left, there's a, a, a law enforcement official with a detection dog. And that dog is actually trained to find skins of big cats. And this dog has found a skin in somebody's car that was being trafficked and sold. And uh, so that's a, a huge law enforcement tool. And then in the right, this is just recording uh, data from traffic skins because we're, we're working on lions and leopards and cheetah already, we can actually assist law enforcement in finding out where these animals are coming from and how to protect them. And then another threat, the last I'll go into the threat, is um, uh, human-wildlife conflict. So as more and more people uh, continue to populate the planet, there's more and more resources necessary. And of course, big cats start coming increasingly into conflict with people. And so sometimes that results in cats killing livestock, even people, and then there's retaliations uh, for that. And um, so that's a big problem in a lot of areas, obviously where there's livestock is one of, one of the biggest problems. And so this is Dr. Sachande again, just treating some, some lions that have been poisoned. He was able to, to save them. They fed on a, on a poisoned elephant, um, but that's obviously not the, the way to long-term to, to resolve human wildlife conflict. And, so we have a, an array of, of work with communities to help mitigate that, to, to increase tolerance for, for predators uh, in and around communities, because that's really what's necessary for, for people that are suffering the consequence of living with, with big cats in those cases. And then lastly, one of the things that we do uh, with, with big cats is in rare exceptions, uh, species reintroduction. So this is, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of The Last Lioness of Liwa. It's a National Geographic film, The Last Lioness actually. Um, and that was filmed many years ago actually. And this lioness in the left-hand side is Lady Liwa. And she was actually the last literally the last lioness in this area in Western Zambia. All her other lion uh, mates had, had been killed or just died off. And so with the uh, work of one of our partners, we, we help them to rent. Okay, it looks like we may have lost Matt for a moment. Um, he's in a pretty remote area uh, and he said sometimes the power can fluctuate. So we may have just had a power blink. So we're just gonna give him a minute and see if he's able to come back in uh, and join us. I think he was just wrapping up and we'll get right to the Q and A um, if he's able to come back in and join us. So fingers crossed uh, that it's just a blink in the signal and that we'll have him back with us shortly. Well, we do wait uh, to see what happens. Um, I'm going to do a quick actually message to Matt because if he's sharing a screen, he might not know that he lost us, but I have his contact. Um, so I'm just going to send him a quick message on his phone to let him know um, that he's frozen because he might not know that if he's still sharing. Uh, let's see. Okay, 
So I sent him the messages. Hopefully he sees them quickly. Looks like the check marks there. So he did see the messages. Good. Um, all right. While we wait uh, for Matt to come back in and join us, I'll give a quick shout out to some of our classes on YouTube. So I can see we have groups who are tuning in with us live via YouTube. Don't forget to use that chat sidebar. I'm going to give a shout out to Mrs. Places group. They're hanging out with us in Miami. So they're joining us. And it looks like we have Mrs. Helton's group who's hanging out with us as well. And somebody just shot me a message uh, to say that uh, they're tuning in from Connecticut. So a big shout out to those groups. Any more groups, uh, send in a shout out on the right. And Matt just said, yeah, the power just blinked. So let's see uh, if it's going to come back on for us. All right. So he's still able to send me messages with his phone. So we might do this a little bit of an unorthodox way. If Matt can't reconnect with us, oh, he exited. So that's a good sign. Um, if he can't reconnect with us, what we might have to do is I can send him the questions via phone um, and then we can get those answers. I hope we don't have to do that, but we do have this backup way that can help us um, worse comes to worse. Let me just see what Matt says back. Okay, so in Zambia, especially this time of the year, it's the wet season. So they get big storms in the afternoon. So there is a big storm moving through and that could uh, be the issue. So let me see what we can do here. Okay, so Matt's gonna try and come in one more time. Then I might try to call him on WhatsApp and see if that will connect for us. Um, so we have a couple options to make this thing work. While we wait to see what Matt's gonna do. Oh, he's got his internet back up. Never mind, he's coming back. All right, we'll give him a second to get back in. We'll start introducing classrooms right away and we'll go right into some Q uh, and A action. Make sure we get some time with Matt. So I do want to fix it at the beginning. I said we have a great group of classrooms joining us from North America, but we also have a classroom joining us from the UK today. So it's always great to have classrooms joining us uh, from other continents as well. And then with Matt, that means this is a three continent event. And I see our classroom in the UK dancing like crazy. So they're pretty excited. So let's see if Matt can uh, come back in. Looks like he's in right now. Hey, <laughs> hey Matt. <laughs> Apologies for that. Uh, am I still on? <laughs> we still got you. You're back. No, we waited. I just talked to the classroom. <laughs> I gave a shout out. We've got some classrooms in Miami and Connecticut and other areas tuning in very, uh, via YouTube. So I just gave them a quick shout out. And I think, Matt, you were close to wrapping up. So if there's something you really want to share, let me know. Uh, and then otherwise, yeah. we can move on to Q&A action. Yeah, I've got uh, two more slides and then I'm ready to go. Um, so Perfect. I've got it open and then I'll just I'll share it now. And yeah, sorry, it's the wet season here and a big storm just has started right after I got done saying it doesn't look like there's any storms. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to finalize um, the work that we do. Probably the most important thing is, is in short, uh, making sure that um, our work is as Zambian led uh, work on conservation of big cats as possible. And so we have an array of of programs to, to do that, to provide aspiring current future conservationists for uh, big cats opportunities. And so we have a, a training program. So it's not just learning about big cats, but it's learning about a, a whole array of things. You can see people need to get under the Land Rover because uh, that happens quite frequently when you're out working and, and just learn a, an array of skills and, and 
experience on that. And we have a women and wildlife conservation program that's Tendiwe in the upper right, uh, training uh, one of our uh, students on big cat conservation work. And so these are the leaders of tomorrow from Zambia, a wildlife uh, vet training program, and they're going to carry the torch, so to speak, uh, for the, the future um, to help ensure that these amazing big cat species are still on the landscape long after we're gone. So with that, um, just wanted to thank you again for the opportunity and uh, I will stop sharing then and, and answer any questions or just hand it over to you, Joe. Yeah, absolutely. If you want to stop the screen share, Matt, so we've got a nice front and center. Perfect. Uh, yeah, no need to apologize for the connection. We're used to that in Explore Classroom. We connect for some pretty remote locations. So the fact that we got you back is pretty good. So we're not going to complain. Yeah, I have to say it was an impressive uh, recovery. Sometimes that uh, out the power's out for a couple hours or even a day. So um, yeah, I'll answer any questions that anybody has while, while the power's good. All right, let's do it. So let's go to our first live classroom. We're gonna go to Mr. Bedouin's class, fourth graders hanging out in Guelph, Ontario. Let me get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Guelph? Hey, guys. I'm gonna guess Guelph is colder than Zambia right now. Yeah. No way. All right, Ember, ask your question. Well, have you had to operate on a cat before? Had, have we had to operate? That's a good question. Uh, we don't typically, even though we have vets, we don't typically do any sort of operations on them because unlike when you take your dog or cat to a vet where you have a clinic and it's basically a hospital, we operate, uh, well, we don't operate, but we conduct our work out in the field. And so we basically want to if we dart an animal, we want to get it uh, treated and get it back up and, and awake as quickly as possible. So the closest we've come to operating is, is really when we're removing snares, which is just treating injuries. So um, we, there's not really operations that you can do uh, with wild animals um, that they would tolerate. For example, if they had a broken leg, what you could do in a vet hospital is probably put it in a cast. If you did that with a wild cat, it would uh, probably tear off the cast and it wouldn't tolerate it. So short answer is no, but a really good question. All right, great question from Guelph, Ontario to start us off. We're gonna go a little further from Guelph this time. We're gonna go to uh, the UK, we're gonna go to England. We have a group of students hanging out with Mrs. Collins. Let me get that microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing boys and girls? Yeah. Yeah. Hey guys. <laughs> um, what information do you get from watching the animals? That's a really good question. We get a lot of different information, as you might imagine. Um, when we're watching them, the first thing we try and do is figure out how many there are. And then, like I said, we know how we know each individual. So we try to determine are all the individuals in that group that we expect to be there, are they there? For example, lions, sometimes we have prides. We had one pride that was 28 lions, if you can imagine. That's a lot of lions. That's like about the size of your class, it looks like. Um, so we, we have to actually take pictures of each animal. Each time we see them, we take pictures because then we look at those pictures and we identify them. So that's like when you take role in class to know who's there. So we get that, we get locations, we determine if anyone's injured, we try and determine if they're what they're eating. If they go hunting, we'll follow them and see if they eat like a buffalo or an antelope or something. Um, and then we try and see if they have any new cubs, for example. Um, they might have, they often have cubs throughout the year, so you never really can be sure uh, so if you don't check them regularly, um, if they might have new cubs. And then with lions, and we'll actually, with all the cats, sometimes you'll see new males will come into the area and, and be uh, spending time with, with the prides. And so basically we get as much information on them as possible. And, and sometimes we collect samples from them. So if they're eating, uh, sounds gross, but it actually has a lot of information. We sometimes collect cat poo, and um, it's not not the glamorous, most glamorous part of the job, but it has a lot of information in it. 
what they eat it has genetics, so you can actually tell who's who the animal is. And sometimes uh, when we um, dart them, then we collect other information from them as well. So lots of information, basically, and a great question. All right, very cool. Let's see. Let's go now to Oklahoma. Mrs. Whitehead's group is joining us. Looks like some grade six students. Let's get that microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, Oklahoma? Good. Hey, guys. <laughs> yeah. um, I think you How long would you would you go to jail if you got caught with animal skin? That's a good question. Uh, it depends on the species. So, but if it's a if it's an endangered species or a species of high value, it would depend on the country. But usually, a couple years if it's um if it's an illegal act. So, so in short, don't do that. So. <laughs> All right, and then uh, is the process say somewhere like Zambia? Is it is it is it a pretty quick process, or is it something that can be drawn out? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, unfortunately, usually the latter. Um, yeah. Wildlife crime is fairly low on the totem pole of, of punishable crimes. And so it can take a long time and it's a lot of complications. But there's a lot of people working on that because as big cats become more and more threatened, we need to have stringent laws protecting them. Absolutely. All right, we're gonna to go to Connecticut now. We have an environmental science class hanging out with Mr. Hoyt. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Woo! Connecticut? Hey, guys. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, our question is, uh, how would the disappearance of big cats and apex predators affect the ecosystem in Zambia? That's a really good question. And uh, that's one of the fundamental things we're looking at because uh, as you're probably learning in your class, apex predators, they're at the top of the ecosystem. So they have more influence than a lot of other species might. And so when you remove, for example, the lion is the, is the apex carnivore in, a, in an African ecosystem. And when you remove them, you have a whole array of, of impacts, both direct. So for example, certain species of herbivores, might increase, they might have more impacts on the, on the vegetation, but also things that we, we don't really think of when we think of um, carnivores is that all these species are competing to various degrees. Um, so we work on a species of, of, it's called an African wild dog or a painted wolf. And it's basically the African version of a, of a wolf, um, ecologically speaking. And so it's not, a, it's not a domestic dog gone wild. And uh, so, they actually are heavily influenced by lions. So where there's lots of lions, they can they might even avoid areas where there's where there's lots of lions. And so those are more indirect, more subtle effects. And then also just the presence of a of a predator on the landscape. We think of what's the impact of a lion? Well, it eats a buffalo, but the presence of a lion can also alter a buffalo's behavior, where it's going to select habitats and how often it eats, how it behaves. And that can in turn uh, have impacts on their nutrition, reproduction, survival. And so those are called risk effects of, of predation. And so we're just starting to learn how important those are too. So in short, if you take a large, a big cat out of, out of an ecosystem, both in Zambia and anywhere in the world, really a large, a large carnivore, you're going to have a whole array of negative ecological impacts uh, that we're only beginning to understand many of them. So great question. All right. So I'm gonna pop over to YouTube quickly to grab a question. We have a class, Mrs. Helton's group, and they've been studying the seven natural wonders. So one that they studied was Victoria Falls. Mm -hmm. And they're wondering, do you study, have any study areas in that region or is it too far uh, south from where you are? Oh, that's great. And uh, Victoria Falls is an absolutely amazing area if you ever have a chance to, to go there. Got a little dry this year with a drought. Uh, the first time there, there wasn't much water going over the falls. But we do not work directly there, but it is part of a larger ecosystem. And so uh, it's very close to some of the ecosystems we, we work on, namely the greater Kafui ecosystem. And there's an idea which maybe you've learned about in your class called transfrontier conservation areas or also peace parks. 
models basically of countries set aside national parks and protected areas, but obviously the animals aren't reading the guidebooks and guidelines as to where one begins and ends. And so a lot of countries are now joining together and creating these parks that span um, different countries. And so there's one called uh, CASA, which you may have heard of, and that covers a bunch of different areas in that region. And Zambia is part of that. And so, um, and Vic Falls is right on the on the border, as you know. And so um, this is an emerging thing, uh, joining these these parks across countries. And that's what we're going to have to do if we're going to protect these species, because these animals require a lot of space and you, you're not going to get that space by not working together. All right. Uh, Mrs. Morin's group hanging out with us in San Antonio, Texas. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, Texas? <laughs> hey guys, how are you? Do some hunters bring the bees to the to the land? Sorry, I didn't hear the first part of your question. It's a little bit of a bad connection. Nice and loud. Looks cold in Texas. <laughs> Do some hunters bring a disease to the lions? Oh, uh, do some, can disease be brought to the lions? Is that the question? Some people or animals can bring disease? Yeah, that's a really good question. And yeah, can I hear yeah. yeah, and absolutely. And so when people, as we, as we were talking, when more and more people are, are getting closer into the areas that big cats live, the chance for disease, both disease from domestic animals to big cats and sometimes from big cats to domestic animals and even people, uh, the disease risk can increase. And rabies, for example, you've probably heard of, you need to get your dog or cat vaccinated for that. Um, it's kind of hard to vaccinate wild animals, but sometimes domestic dogs in a lot of these areas don't get vaccinated and they can have rabies outbreaks or, or distemper and some other sorts of diseases. And that can spread to big cats. And so we actually, uh, like a number of, of organizations, do vaccination programs with domestic dogs in, in communities around big cat populations because that protects their dogs and protects them too in case their dogs get rabies, uh, but it also protects big cats. So very good question. All right, we're gonna take a trip now to Oakville, Ontario. Some fifth graders hanging out with Mr. Smith. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing Oakville? I did in Oakville. Okay, so my question is, have you ever gotten a chance to do a National Geographic live presentation or any other big presentations like that? Uh, I have done, I think, one other National Geographic Live, but this is the first one I've done with classrooms. So uh, I'm very honored and privileged to to uh, do this with you all. So um, first first opportunity. So great question. Hopefully first of many. All right. Very cool. Well, we can tell you that Matt and Tandy, who you met during the presentation, uh, we sent them one of our satellite units so about the size of a textbook. And that's going to let them in the new year broadcast live from the field for us. So who knows what we're going to be able to see. Uh, we're going to do a few events, hopefully, uh, with Matt and Tandy in the new year. So hopefully this is just the first of more to come, like Matt said. Yeah, we're really excited to use that, that unit because uh, it's not, uh, not confined to an office or an internet connection. And so we can take it out in the field and hopefully broadcast live next to some cats or something like that. All right, so let's steal another question from YouTube. So this group here is wondering about leopards. So they're wondering um, about the leopards in Zambia. Are they um, rare or is it just hard to find them when you're studying them? What's it like studying them in, in Zambia? 
That's a really good question. And um, leopards are really hard to find. They're kind of like mountain lions in, in the States or jaguars in, in um, Central and South America. And the, um, so yes, they are very hard to find. That makes them very difficult to study. But Zambia is a great area for leopards. In fact, uh, here in the Luangwa where I'm talking from, um, we see leopards all the time. In fact, I've been sitting here in, in my office here. Uh, one night I was typing on a computer like I'm doing now and all of a sudden a leopard jumped on a baboon right on top of the roof. And we have a tin roof, you can imagine the sound that made. And uh, so we, we frequently see leopards around here. It's not unusual to see several in a day. They're usually in, uh, active in the night, but you can certainly see them around here. So yes, they are hard to find, but this is the best place I've ever seen to see leopards. So they're doing well in these areas. All right, very cool. So Matt, does um, the program, the uh, ZCP, do you guys have uh, like a Twitter or an Instagram account? We have an Instagram account and actually we were just talking about getting a Twitter account. Um, so we will be getting a Twitter account, but we have an Instagram and a Facebook account. Okay, so there we go, classrooms. You wanna dig a little bit deeper, uh, you can find find a little more information and probably some cool photos uh, on the Instagram account. And what is that, Matt? Is it just uh, like Zambian carnivore program? Yeah, the um, Instagram is ZCP, ZCP. So, um, but I think I actually, unfortunately don't have it handy here, but I could, I could get it. But I think if you just type Zambian carnivore program into Instagram or Facebook, you'll find it. All right, that sounds good. It's always fun to see uh, a few pictures in action. And how's the weather yeah. uh, over there? Is it coming, is it a storm moving in? How are things looking? Uh, well, it's looking better than it was when the power went out. There's, it looks like a storm might come through and that's typical now, the rains are here. It used to be, it's really hot, gets up to about over a hundred degrees, around 40 degrees Celsius. And uh, then you get some afternoon storms coming in. But we were just, for, for the better part, from about May to now, we didn't get any rain, which is typical. So it's the dry season. And then suddenly you get tons of rain. So the place goes from just completely dry, everything gray, to now it is a jungle. So it's a pretty dramatic change. So it's a beautiful time of year to be here. All right. And I tracked it down on Instagram. It's ZCP underscore org, O-R-G. So if you guys want to check out, there's tons of really cool pictures. I'm just flipping through. Uh, some now. Yeah, Lots we of got awesome, awesome pictures. No shortage of cool pictures. So we encourage yeah. you to check it out. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, oh, good. Uh, Mrs. Eccles class, we we're just about to, to sign out for today, but I see you guys managed to get back into the event. So we have Mrs. Eccles class. We lost them for just a minute. Uh, they're joining us from San Antonio, Texas. So I'm going to let you guys squeeze in uh, our final question today. Um, what are the big cat's main, main diet? That's a really good question. Do you have a, a particular species, lion or cheetah or leopard, or just mm -hmm. in general? Um, cheetah. Cheetah, yeah. Cheetah, they, they eat a lot of different things, but usually a small antelope. So uh, in... Africa, there's a lot of different antelope species and they range from really small to really large. And so the other cat species like lion typically eat much larger things than, than cheetah, but cheetah can eat small antelope, um, the size of like a, a small dog and they eat uh, scrub hares. So those are like rabbits. And, but the, the, the base of their, their diet is typically small, so, small to mid-sized antelope. And so, whereas lion eats something a lot larger. And you might wonder why, why don't they all eat the same thing? Well, they're kind of competing as well. So a cheetah doesn't want to run into a lion because it's dangerous for them. A lion could kill them because they're much bigger and stronger. And so it's thought, well, if, if you eat the same thing, you might run, your chances of running into each other will increase, right? It's like if you are 
going to the same restaurant as somebody else, you're probably going to see them eventually. But if you go to different ones, then you probably will minimize your chances of running into each other. And that's what cheetahs might be doing by eating the smaller stuff, because lions aren't typically going to waste their time eating small antelope. They want buffalo and giraffe and big stuff. And um, so, yeah, cats eat a wide variety of, of food, but um, different species have different diets often. And it also depends on what's available. Certain areas of Africa, there's there's certain species of antelope available that aren't in other areas. So um, it reflects what's available and it also reflects the size and hunting techniques of the different species. So great question. All right. Well, a huge shout out to our classrooms tuning in on YouTube today. Thanks for the awesome questions. A huge shout out to our camera classroom. You guys are awesome. Thanks for all uh, the questions from Canada, the US and uh, in England. And then Matt, thank you so much for taking some time today, sharing a great presentation and all the awesome conservation work that you're doing. Keep it up and we look forward to hopefully some hangouts in the field in the new year. Yeah, thanks a lot, Joe. And thanks to everyone for tuning in and, and giving us the opportunity to talk about uh, one of our favorite subjects. And so stay warm and uh, hope to talk to you guys again soon. All right, I'm going to unmute all the microphones, boys and girls, nice and loud. A big goodbye and thank you uh, to Matt before we sign off. <laughs> all right, you guys are pretty good at that. Thanks so much, everybody, for the excited goodbye. Matt, thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, we'll Thanks see again, you guys Jerry, on our too. next Explore classroom. Okay, we'll be in touch. Thanks, guys. Thank you.